Greetings and welcome to the Daniel study. It's been a couple weeks and I'm glad that we're together again. We are going to go be in Daniel chapter 7 this evening and this is going to be teaching number 18. But let's start with a little story to kind of get us in the mood for the theme for tonight. W.B. Hinson, a great pe preacher of the past, spoke from his very own experience just before he died. He said, I remember a year ago when the doctor told me, you have an illness and you won't recover. I walked out where I lived five mile in, uh, miles from Portland, Oregon, and looked across the mountains that I love. I looked at the river in which I rejoice, and I looked at the stately trees that were always God's poetry to my soul. Then in the evening, I looked up into the great sky where God was lighting his lamps, and I said this, I may not see you many more times, but mountain, I shall be alive when you're gone. And river, I shall be alive when you cease to run toward the sea. And stars, I shall be alive when you have fallen from your sockets in the great downputting of the material universe. That's something good for us to meditate on. We strive in this life to acquire things, yet they will all vanish someday. This world is passing away, and what we need to focus on is God's kingdom, which is everlasting. As we enter this section of Daniel, we will hear of what the future holds for this world. We must be strong in the Lord because tribulation is ahead. Heavenly Father, we come before your throne and we do want to be focused on your kingdom, Father. Help the world to fade away into the background and help us, Lord, to do your kingdom work. I pray for anyone listening and for us that are, are here in this room this evening that you would empower us with your spirit. You would give us wisdom and discernment. Lord, that we in these times could do the work of your kingdom. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, in chapter 7, we move from what is known as a historical narrative, which were the stories that we see that are rooted in real stories, into Daniel's apocalyptic visions. The first six chapters of Daniel are history, but 7 through 12 are prophecy. The seventh chapter of Daniel is considered to be one of the most comprehensive and detailed prophecies of the future events of the world within the Old Testament. This is pure prophecy. The record of God's incredible, unchanging plan for the nations. Daniel conveys prophetic truth through signs and symbols, just like John did when we studied the book of Revelation. Daniel has several prophetic dreams and visions that took place over the period of 22 years. Chapter 7 is a dream that's given to Daniel, and it will be interpreted by an angel. We will begin to look at this, this dream tonight. And then as the months unfold, we'll look at the vision of the ram and the goat. We'll look at the 70-week prophecy We'll look at the vision, the vision of the glorious man and so forth. We know that even the secular world knows something is coming. Something is going to happen because we see this end of the world theme all around us. It's very popular. We see it in books. We see it in movies. We see it in television shows. A recent poll of U.S. News and World Report cites that 66% of, um, 66 of Americans, including a third of those who say they have never ever attended church, admit that they believe Jesus will return to the earth someday. God gave these visions and dreams to Daniel to bring hope to the captives of Judah, but also to give hope to every generation that's living in this fallen world, to know that God most certainly has a hope for the future of those who believe. Someday, evil will be overcome. Daniel gives us hope so that we will wait patiently 
and not give in to the culture and the world around us. When I taught on the introduction to the book of Daniel, I mentioned that the book of Daniel is not written in chronological order. Now what's going to happen is at the beginning of each chapter, Daniel is going to let us know how it fits in chronologically. The visions found in um, these chapters that we're going to see are after the death of Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, chronologically, chapters 7 and 8 took place before chapter 5. Chapter 5 was the rule of Belshazzar and the writing on the wall. Well, these, these two chapters will take place before that. But chapters 9 through 12 take place after chapter 5 when the Medo and Persian Empire is reigning. But as each chapter occurs, Daniel's going to let us know chronologically where those are placed. So let us read from Daniel chapter 7, beginning at verse 1. And here Daniel is going to tell us where it fits in. He says, In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head while on his bed. Then he wrote down his dream, telling the main facts. Daniel spoke, saying, I saw in my vision by night... And behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. And four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. The first was like a lion and had eagle wings. I watched till its wings were plucked off and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man. And a man's <coughs> heart was given to it. And suddenly another beast, a second like a bear, it was raised up on one side, and it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said thus to it, Arise, devour much flesh. <coughs> After this I looked, and there was another, like a leopard, which had on his back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this I saw in a night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them, before whom the three of the first horns were plucked out by the root. And there in his horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking pompous words. As we go through this chapter in the book of Daniel, I just want to make it clear that I am not taking a preterist view of this chapter. A preterist view is that everything has been fulfilled or most of it has been fulfilled. Because I truly believe that what we're seeing here in Jan Daniel chapter 7 is fully prophetic. In other words, this is still an anticip anticipated future prophecy. And the reason that I think so is because of our study in the book of Revelation. Chapter 7 is one of those chapters that are hard to interpret. It tells us about four strange beasts that Daniel saw in a series of visions from God. The majority of Bible experts believe these four strange beasts represent the same four world kingdoms from Nebuchadnezzar's dream of the statue in chapter 2. But I don't think so. The reason that I don't think so is there are so many differences between the two that I, I, I can't see them being the same vision. The first thing is, is that the symbols that are used and the number of symbols are not the same. The statue of, that Nebuchadnezzar had in his dream has five materials, gold, silver, bronze, iron, and a mixture of iron and clay. But the beast only has four beasts, a lion, a bear, a leopard, and the terrifying beast. The beast vision, it tells us, is in the first year of Belshazzar's reign. So, so we know that this is at the end 
of the Babylonian Empire. Now, if we look further down in the book of Daniel, chapter 7, it tells us that these, these, these um, beasts were coming out of the sea, coming out of the earth, and um, it says that they will come. In other words, they haven't come yet. It's, it's in the future tense, and the Babylonian Empire is, was already here. As a matter of fact, it, it's, 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 it, it existed already, and um, <clears throat> so how could that be the lion who's yet to come? It doesn't equate. Then the end of the kingdoms play out very differently. We're told in Daniel 7 that the first three beasts will outlive the fourth beast. Let me read the verses that tell us that. Seven, uh, chapter 7, verse 11 says this. I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body destroyed and thrown into the blazing fire. The other beast had been stripped of their authority, but were allowed to live for a period of time. We can see in the dream with the statue that the five materials of the statues lived at different times. The gold kingdom existed, then that went out, and then the silver kingdom came in, and then that went out, and then the bronze kingdom came in, and that went out, and so forth. But as we look at the vision of the beast, the four beasts all live at the same time. How could it be the same prophecy? They did not, the, the, the four beasts coexist together, but the empires in the statue do not. So how could it be the same? Um, and then it says that the, the first three, I witnessed the destruction of the fourth. Right? I just read that verse where they saw that fourth one being thrown into the pit of fire, right? Um, so it just doesn't seem to match up to me that they're the same. I truly think that they're different. Um, the statue to me is the historical account of the empires which has passed. Yet I believe that the, the vision of the beast is prophetic. It's an account of the end time one world government. Two different things. In the statue of the dream of Nebuchadnezzar, the gold, silver, and bronze kingdoms also will not exist at Jesus' return. They are past history, but the beasts in the vision will all be alive when Jesus returns because Jesus is the one that's going to throw the fourth one into the lake of fire. So how can they be the same vision? In the vision of the statue, Daniel knew what the gold head was. He knew that the gold head was Babylon. But in this vision of the beast, he has no idea who the winged lion is. He couldn't figure out this dream with the beast, which if you would think that they were the same, Daniel would have some type of discernment that they were the same vision. The three, the first three beasts in the beast vision appear to be associated with the kingdom of the Antichrist, which we see is confirmed in Revelation 13, 2. And all of them in the book of Revelation 13 are future and not past. Now, I just have to say that I know that those who believe that the statue and the beast of, of chapter 7 are the same have their reasons for believing so but for me when I look at the two in comparison I cannot see that they match they don't match up to me so although I do believe um, that these are the same in a certain aspect um, I believe that Nebuchadnezzar's statue and the beast vision reveal a pattern God is showing us a pattern. He's showing us a picture of four successive historical pagan empires that will be succeeded by one final empire, and that is the last day's empire. 
So I think that this is totally prophetic and there's nothing historical about this chapter. So it says, in the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, this is when Daniel has this vision and it's prior to the night of the writing on the wall. It says, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head while he was, while he was on his bed. Then he wrote down the dream telling the main facts. I love that the scripture gives us this detail that he wrote down the vision, but he only wrote down the main facts. I was thinking about that. You know how sometimes we receive a word from the Lord and we kind of start to think about it and we kind of interpret it ourselves? I think that the Lord didn't want Daniel to interpret this at all. He just wanted Daniel to write down the facts. He wanted it to be so because he didn't want the water muddied with Daniel's opinion. He just wanted the facts of the vision. So Daniel wrote those down. It says that Daniel spoke saying, I saw in my vision by night and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. Now this is not a literal scene. This is actually symbols because we learn later on down in verse 17 of chapter seven that the four beasts that come from the sea are really interpreted by the angel as arising from the earth. So we know what Daniel's seeing is um, a set of symbols. In other words, Daniel sees the four winds stirring, and I kind of picture this four winds stirring as like this tornado, this evil that's swirling about over the sea of humanity, the world, that's the world, the sea of humanity, and out of that rises the beasts. To the Hebrew mindset, the sea was relentless. It was dangerous and it was mysterious. And I don't know if you remember from our study in the book of Revelation, the four winds actually represent demonic forces because we see this same type of picture in the book of Revelation chapter 7 verse 1 where the four winds um, uh, gather together and it is pictured as an evil force. And what's kind of interesting is, is Satan has that title, the prince of the power of the air. So it says in Ephesians that this prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. So these four winds are swirling and these people are gonna be coming up from the earth, these sons of disobedience. And this makes sense to me, but there's many viable interpretations for this verse, but this one is the one that makes the most sense to me because I feel like those demonic forces are stirring up over um, the sea because it's the Middle East and it is, um, it's stirring up war at the end of the age. Of course, the end time demonic forces will rule the whole entire earth but the main focus will be concentrated around the Mediterranean Sea. And the reason that I say this is because Daniel refers to what is known as the Great Sea. In ancient times, the Great Sea was a reference to the Mediterranean Sea. And so this demonic forces are stirring up around the nations that surround the Mediterranean Sea. Now the four winds not only refer to the disturbing conditions out of which these nations will rise, but it also concerns ideologies that will capture people's minds on the earth in the end days. God tells us in scripture specifically not to join in these ideologies, but to be mature in our faith. It tells us that in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14, it says that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. That's what's going to be happening in the end days. And what God is trying to tell us is because it says doctrine there. It's coming into the church. These 
false concept, these world views are going to come into the church and it's going to be made to seem like this is the truth of God. And it is a false doctrine. So we have got to keep our minds focused. And as children of God, we've got to examine any ideology that we're taking in. We have to examine every thought. We have to capture every thought because we know that that is our weapon of warfare. It tells us that in 2 Corinthians, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought captive into captivity to the obedience of Christ. And these thoughts, it says in there, will exalt themselves against the knowledge of Christ. They're going to try to be above the Lord. Anyway, in verse 3, we're told that the four grace beasts came up from the sea, each different from one another. The Bible uses animals very often to represent kingdoms. And even today we do for our nations, right? We have the lion, which is the symbol of Great Britain. We have the eagle, which is the symbol of the United States. Most nations have an animal symbol. Now, using the word beast to describe the leaders of these kingdoms is so appropriate. Because they are going to be spawns of Satan. They are going to be like beasts. We know that Satan, in Revelation chapter 13, is referred to as the beast coming out of the sea. So they're going to be spawns of Satan. And what will these beasts be like? Well, they're going to be like beasts. They're going to be savage. They're going to be without a moral compass. They're going to have no conscience. And they will destroy anything that will stand in the way of their will. That's what a beast does. And this picture of these leaders in the end days, for many Christians around the world, they totally understand this image because they are living under harsh regiments and they are living under in areas where Christianity and Christians are hated. They understand what it means when this says the beast or the beasts that come up. They are living in tribulation as we speak right now. We have people in China, Indonesia, Iraq, Iran, and that's just to name a few. There's people in Africa living under these harsh regiments, under these beasts of people. That is what these four leaders are going to come up, and they're going to be beasts. Although we don't experience this type of oppression or persecution, we can see it on the horizon, can we not? We see it closing in. I just think about our elections and the unrest that were in the streets of the United States of America, and they called them protests. That was unrest in our streets. The lack of tolerance towards a conservative worldview. We have a society of self-seeking human beings who are in rebellion against God. And I know that they wouldn't define it that way. They would say it was, it's their rights. But honestly, we have a society that is in rebellion against God. The Apostle Paul defines human nature in this way in Romans 3, 10 through 18. And this describes the man without God. It says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. They're, with their tongues, they have practiced deceit. The poison of asap is on, upon their lips whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. That is the human being who walks this earth without God. And even us that are walking with God, we're still sinners. We're still living in our flesh. We're still battling our flesh. 
we can miss the mark as well. Well, let's look at the description of these first three beasts this evening. The first beast, it says, is like a lion, and it had eagle wings. And it says that I watched, Daniel was watching, and the, the wings were plucked off of this lion. And he was lifted up to his feet, and he became like a man. And it says that he was given the heart of a man. Now, some experts, some Bible experts, believe that this was Babylon. But there's others that claim that Babylon was never symbolized by a lion. And England really is the only nation to ever have a standing lion, not a sitting lion, but a standing lion as its symbol. And this idea of the eagle's wings being plucked off the lion is the United States of America because we came from Britain. So this really could be a picture of England. And then it says, and suddenly another beast, a second like a bear. It was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said to it thus, arise, devour much flesh. Well, the bear is believed to be Russia. Russia for generations has been symbolized by a bear. Matter of fact, in our Olympic Games in Moscow in the 1980s, Russia used the bear as its symbol. It is definitely a country, too, that has devoured much flesh. Even Hitler in his day did not kill as many people that have been killed through Russia. It is said that in the Russia Revolution, in the prison camps of Siberia, they took over 20 million lives. In the Volgate famines, which were totally politically motivated, over six million people perished. Under Stalin, the conservative <coughs> estimate is 20 million, but I have read estimates of up to 60 million people died under Stalin. And then World War II, 20 million. A bear that devours flesh is a very good description of Russia. Also, this bear, Russia, is believed to be, um, to be the bear because of Gog and Magog that we see in Ezekiel chapter 38 through 39. It's believed to be Russia along with some Islamic nations like Iraq, Iran, Syria, Turkey that will pose the final threat against Israel. That's why Russia, the bear, has those three ribs in his mouth because those are the three nations that are gonna be plucked out. And it will most likely be one of those, one of the, you know, three of those nations that I mentioned. It's, it, it tells us in scripture that Russia and her allies will go to war against Israel to devour her and Everyone will abandon Israel. Everyone. Everyone will abandon Israel. And what's really interesting is in Ezekiel, it all is centering around the Mediterranean Sea. So it all plays into one another. And we must not forget that this empire will be on the scene when the Antichrist arrives. Could it be truly that the bear is Russia and the three ribs are representative parts of nations like maybe southern Turkey, northern Syria, Iraq, Iran? It's very possible. So verse 6 says, After this I looked and there was another, like a leopard, which had on his back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. Well, I have read um, about this strange type of leopard with four wings and four heads. I have learned that there's a theory that it could be Germany. And I find that theory really interesting because Germany um, has um, produced a tank for war that's called the leopard tank. 
And that is predominantly what is used in all the European armies since the 1960s, the leopard tank. The four heads could be understood as the Fourth Reich. Remember, Germany had the Third Reich with Hitler, and that was an attempt to gain world do uh, domination, right, in World War II. But the Fourth Reich is one that will be emerging. So the Fourth Reich is the fourth face of Germany. The leopard Daniel saw also had the bird wings, right? Which is really interesting, too, because um, France is a nation that's symbolized by a rooster. And France and Germany have collaborated on the design of this leopard tank. And both of them are founding members of the European Union. So I find this really, really interesting. So the many heads of the leopard may encompass the many nations like from the European Union. And I just have to say that this is all just a theory that's formulated with clues from scripture and looking at what's happening on the world stage. Of course, no one knows who these nations are. Nobody has a hold on who these nations are, but we can give it an educated guess. Well, we're gonna leave off here. Um, and when we return, we're gonna pick up with the description of the Antichrist, but we're also gonna look at the Ancient of Days and the Son of Man. When I think about these two cho choices, follow the Antichrist, or follow Jesus Christ, I say to myself, it's a no-brainer. So why would people make a different choice and follow the Antichrist? Well, because history bears it out. When we look at Germany, when we look at what happened with, with Hitler in Germany, um, when we look back, they followed him because they were ripe for the picking. You see, Germany's economy crashed, the middle class lost all of its savings, and every pension was wiped out. And then someone steps onto the scene who has all the answers. And this is what's going to happen when the Antichrist comes. He's going to come, and he's going to seem to have all the answers. And not only that, he's going to demonstrate it with such power, because he's going to have signs and wonders that follow him. Scary. But I just want to say, if you are a true believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you will not be deceived by the Antichrist. So if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, I ask you to get on your knees today and ask him into your life because he will come and he will save you from the hands of the Antichrist. Heavenly Father, we just come before your throne. We thank you, Lord, for your scripture for how you've spoken to us, Lord, how amazing your prophecies are, how we see so many of them fulfilled from the Old Testament in the work of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the Savior of the world. Lord, I just uh, lift up this teaching before you, and I pray that anybody that is listening will have ears to hear, Lord, that they would come to salvation, Father, that they would spread the word, and that they would become part of your kingdom to help in these end times. We love you, we thank you, and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.